Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Don Bibar from Avalon Advanced Materials. How are you today, Don? Great to be back, Tracy. Doing fine. And Don, just uh, let's start with the uh, most um, most interesting thing. Of course, again, your stock moved up forty percent in one day, and and I'm going to draw our attention to this because you have one of the most unusual stocks for geopolitical headlines hit, and boom, out of nowhere, everybody comes pouring in. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about that? Well, basically, it stems from the fact that we've been in this business for over twenty years now, and we're very well known amongst investors in the U.S. in particular for our lead role in the rare earths bubble 10 years ago. And so we're still known as a rare earths equity. <clears throat> and whenever there's kind of new d developments and news headlines related to the risk on security of supply, then you'll see speculative trading activity in, uh, in Avalon. And that's what we saw again last week, I'm pretty sure. Well, I mean, arguably, even though people perceive you as rare earths, you're still in the rare earths and critical materials game, are you not, Don? Absolutely. And our strategy has been to have a diversified asset base that gives us exposure to a broad range of these new emerging critical materials. So we're basically positioned to react to when there's a new uh, demand in the marketplace. And of course, Don, uh, we want to take you back to these geopolitical issues. There's so many different uh, policies that are being announced in Washington, D.C. Um, you want to comment on which particular one or which headline do you think uh, was the cause for the accelerant that day? Well, I think it was more the news on the um, consulate being closed in Houston by the U.S. government, and then China reacting to that and retaliating by closing the U.S. consulate in Chengdu. <clears throat> that was kind of an indication of an escalation in the hostilities there, which I think was one of the sparks for um, that speculation on maybe rare earth supplies are at risk again. Well, of course, because of your experience in this industry, I mean, if a, you did introduce me to rare earths in 2008, um, do you have any comments about some of the most recent announcements? I mean, we've got everything from Joe Biden's $2 trillion green infrastructure and jobs plan to the uh, more recent one that was sent to me out of D.C. on the $77.3 million Defense Production Act, Title III, COVID-19 actions and how it would affect rare earths. Would you like to comment on either of those for us? Well, yeah, the second one I thought was a very significant one in that there's already been uh, programs announced that are designed to provide funding for creating new supplies, supporting new mineral development projects like M materials. And it was uh, refreshing to see a program that was more oriented to the downstream components of the rare earth supply chains and making funding available to create those. Because as most of your uh, listeners would know, with rare earths, it's mostly about creating the demand pull for the rare earths and not so much the supply. The new producers need to have markets to be able to serve in domestic markets. Well, and of course, you know, the European Commission $750 billion green infrastructure plan. Um, I'd love your comments on that. But the thing that I would really love is for a better understanding of what Canada Canadian critical materials uh, policy is presently and any comments that you have on that. Yeah, well, it's been quite a bit of uh, work being done there uh, when Prime Minister agreed with President Trump to collaborate on creation of these critical mineral supply chains in uh, North America. They asked the bureaucracy to start to come up with a plan for how to do that. And because it's relatively new for most people in government, it's taken a while for uh, government to kind of understand the scope of the issue here and what makes sense in terms of policy initiatives to help enable these uh, supply chains to get uh, started here. So I've been uh, pulled into that conversation for quite a while now. And um, one of the main players now engaged in that conversation is uh, CREEN, the Canadian Rare Earth Elements Network. 
that you recall we created um, <clears throat> about uh, eight years ago during the first rare earth boom. And it's really the only organization of any type that has a focus in Canada on these uh, critical mineral supply chains, albeit specifically uh, rare earths. But it has been quite active lately in that dialogue um, with the Canadian government. And so with regards to that, uh, you know, you, you do all this work and of course a major, a, a substantial or significant action that occurs, usually U.S. Chinese tensions, uh, which directly hits the Avalon stock. I think investors out there should take a second to actually hear what the competitive advantages are. I mean, you know, all the investors could run to any stock, but every single time they pick Avalon. So tell those investors out there why they should buy and hold. <laughs> well, I think uh, we still provide exposure to uh, rare earths, although we have a partner now that's working with us at Natchalacho. We've maintained our main resource there as future upside on that uh, project. And in the meantime, we continue to look at other possibilities to create new rare earth supplies by looking at how we can use new technology to recover them from non-traditional sources such as historic uh, mine weights. And I still think there's a lot of opportunities there to uh, do something um, creative that can bring a supply to market a little more quickly at a relatively low cost by taking advantage of some of these uh, innovative new technologies like uh, ion exchange and some of the variants on that out there. So, Don, would you like to, uh, uh, what should shareholders, what, you know, with COVID-19, what should we anticipate? I'm certain that's had some challenges for you at Avalon Advanced Materials. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about that and how you're proceeding into the fall? Yeah, so um, we have had to um, lock down the office here and just come in occasionally when you're up all by yourself like I am today. But uh, ha everyone's been pretty busy uh, working from home. And our focus now is on taking advantage of the opportunity in lithium markets to bring our separation rapids project along. We're permitted now to um, recover a bulk sample, a large bulk sample, to finalize our process flow sheets, do a pilot plant run, and produce some product samples for the customers that have expressed interest in the product in the glass industry, as well as uh, start to revisit serving the battery materials uh, market going forward here too. So what would be the next steps for separation rapids? Well, what are your plans? So the key is to recover that bulk sample in the near term. So we're now getting ready to uh, go ahead with that program uh, in September, get that bulk sample extracted, crushed, and then start to uh, process it to produce those samples. And that's a key step for us to define the market opportunities and our business model for the final feasibility study on um, how we will ultimately develop this. But we're also getting pretty keen on looking at the battery materials market. Some of the current forecasts on growth there are astronomical. <laughs> so there definitely needs to be new suppliers. And there is, of course, no supply in Canada yet. And a real opportunity, I think, to uh, establish a battery materials facility in northern Ontario somewhere to serve that growing new market. And that's something we're focused on right now. Well, Don, as always, it's a real pleasure. Thank you so much for your timely update. Thank you, Tracy.